my name is Pip Tabor. I'm project manager for something called the Southern Uplands Partnership. And uh, SUP has been working over the last year with a number of partners looking at the energy efficiency supply chain because um, it's become apparent that if we're going to get all our housing stock up to being net zero by the target the government has set us, there is a massive amount of work that requires to be done. And having worked with the trades in Tweeddale in particular, it's quite clear that we need to change things quite a lot if, if we're going to deliver that work that's required. Um, SUP has been around for 20 years doing a whole range of projects to do with sustainable development in its broadest sense. And um, we've been using leader funding for a lot of that, that time. I'm not sure how many people here have had any dealings with leader, but it's, it's a really good fund. It's funded some fantastic work, but over recent years it's become more and more and more bureaucratic and, and problematic and um, lots of people have been scared off it. And we were really delighted when earlier this year the, the previous leader program closed and a new one was put forward called Rural Communities Testing Change, which isn't a very catchy name. But it is money that's actually apparently going to be easy to, to get hold of. It's not in huge lumps of money yet. It's, it's relatively small and modest. But we were offered a small amount of funding to do a project. If we could generate that project tick the boxes that are required to be ticked and deliver it by the end of January and that's been put back to February now but it was such a good opportunity that we put a couple of proposals in and Visit, Visit Kelso put a proposal in and um, Simon Lynch who runs that programme came and said could we join forces and do this project together. So Emily and myself and Jonathan um, put the idea of doing something around uh, what, what is net zero, what does it mean for local businesses and how do we move forward, um, towards, for, towards achieving the opportunities that are there. Um, so that's where this project came about. It's going to be two events, one tonight, one in January, February time, which is going to look probably more specifically at the trades people and what trades can, uh, how trades can adapt to the work that's going to be required. Um, but we thought tonight, since it's just a few weeks since COP26 finished, it's a really good opportunity to think about what does COP26 mean to local businesses, how do local businesses take advantage of the, the, the change that's coming down the road, and we're delighted tonight that we've got Martin Valenti here, who is Mr. Cop, and knows an awful lot about cop, cop. <laughs> <laughs> good and bad cop. Um, and he's going to talk to us about what we actually mean by net zero and, and what the opportunities behind that are. And then we've got a couple more speakers who I'll introduce uh, a little bit later on, um, who are going to try and put that sort of high-level strategic view into a slightly more sort of local focus. I brought this, not as a guide, just, but it's to remind me of time because Emily knows me and I'm a blather. I think the term is because I've got a lot to say on this topic because it's dead exciting. And I know you're going to find that an oxymoron, climate change, net zero, dead exciting, but it is. And I'm going to try and convince you that in the next few minutes. So that's a brilliant question. Whoever came up with that is genius because that is part of the challenges people are faced with this nomenclature system is about ecosystem services, environmental I actually can't even bother listening to them anymore because I get fed up with them. But that one's pretty good because that allows us to address two of the biggest challenges we face today. One of them is cutting emissions, which is the zero part, and the other one is uh, our nature disappearing in front of our eyes. I'm not David Dantenberg, as you can clearly see, but if I was here, you'd all be tears in your eyes about how he tells the story about nature. But it is a major challenge for society, and even in Scotland, we're starting to see real big threats on our nature and our biodiversity. And it's a significant, significant challenge. So someone clever came up with the term net zero. There are definitions you can Google. I suggest you don't do that because it'll make your head spin. Some of them chat about the amount of emissions that you emit in the air. And if you can sequester that same amount, that's net. That's all nice and it's technical. For me, the, the narrative I'd hope you address and think about and consider is the net zero. Net, nature. How do we use nature? and what nature gives us to help us address some of the recalcitrant, tricky to reach climate change challenges uh, and emissions. And I'll explain what that means in reality. So I'm Martin, hello, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you Emily for the invite, you might regret it, because I'm a blether. Uh, and hello people who are zooming in, watching us from the comfort of their, their sofas and so on. So I was at COP26 and as the name would suggest, there's been 25 before, 24 of them are complete failures because what was pitched, and you saw a lot of it from Greta Thunberg and people like that, you saw a lot of combative narrative. Somebody has to be blamed for climate change. We need to find out who that is and we need to spend an awful lot of time blaming them and shaming them. Big mistake, because it hasn't worked. 
I'm reaching a very significant birthday next month. Don't say 21, because that ship sailed many years ago. I'm afraid it's 60. So I've been involved in so many different sectors of this, this narrative. And every sector I've worked in, the public sector, the private sector, the third sector, my own business, local, national, central government, Interpol, believe it or not, I've been involved, I'm quite old. And everywhere I am, everyone else thinks it's someone else's problem that you're suddenly having to pick up the mess that's been left by a stupid economic system or a overburdening regulatory system or a nature system that no one can actually get involved in. No one can actually monetize what it means to protect nature. So here we are in this combative environment. So for 25, sorry, 24 cops, the narrative, and I'm paraphrasing here, the overarching narrative was, what do we have, what, what, what will we lose if we don't address climate change? And whose fault was it anyway? And let's get economic systems which are all over the place to try and agree to the one global agreement. Even thinking about that, if you get 25 of your, uh, sorry, 190 of your family members and friends together, try and pick a menu for Christmas. Right? So what you were doing, you were getting all these world leaders coming from tiny, tiny little nations who have had no, nothing to do with the climate problem, suddenly being told, see this prosperity we've got, you really can't have that now, I'm sorry, but you know, we've, we've had a smashing free healthcare and education system based on our tax tape, based on business, but we don't want you to have that. And they're going, hold on a minute, we didn't cause any of these problems and we're going to be penalised by them. So it's no surprise that you got combat. I'm not a military expert in combat, at least to casualties. Then what sensible nation, Scotland, or any other country for that matter, would spend its time in combat? What would be the point of that? The point of that was politics and sometimes, uh, I nearly say the bad word there, but I won't, I'm a professional. Sometimes just the narrative was somebody should do something about climate change and not me though, but I think somebody else should. And it just resulted in, in despair and disaster until Paris. I don't know if it was the romance of Paris, Emily. It could have been the people get caught up in the romance of Paris and, and the fact that it was a woman, just mentioning that, that got the Paris Climate Agreement, whereas the 24 were all failed by men. Just, just, a, just a, I'm sure it was... That's a different session, I think. Different session. We'll do that another day. <laughs> and Christiana Figueres from Costa Rica got people together and she changed the narrative. She thought... I've watched people saying who's to blame for climate change and then coming together and then arguing and falling out, leaving the room. And it actually suited some countries to have that argument. Well then, we, if you're not going to get involved, we won't. And they're walking to the room smiling, thinking, I can just go back to the hamster wheel. I can just continue to do what, I can, what I've done all the time and nobody notices it because I can blame the agreement. Well, of course, we would get involved, but, but uh, Canada didn't agree. Well, we would get involved, but, but America didn't agree. And that's what we started to see. We started to see conflict winning over... Uh, collaboration. We started to see fear winning over hope. Donald Trump, remember him? You know, he said, forget climate change, that's somebody else's problem. And it's it's expensive and it's stupid. And perhaps probably isn't even real. And what you got was people going, do you know what, he's probably onto something here. But what we saw on December the 3rd last year, November the 3rd last year, thankfully, was a rejection of that and a, and a big punt from humankind saying, we really need to think about others, not just herself, something similar to COVID there. We need to think about codependence rather than independence. We need to think about how we work collaboratively rather than uh, combatively. I don't even know if that's a word. So what Christiana Figueres did said, you're coming to Paris and we're not going to find out who to blame. We're not going to criticise anyone. We're not going to get involved in combat. We're going to think about, in fact, here's the narrative. What do we have to gain? by tackling climate change and then start to speak about this word that sounds like an oxymoron. Hello. Sorry, probably. That's, that's okay, you're on next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and the narrative changed from climate emergency to climate opportunity. Now, I know when I say that, some people in the room will go, I don't feel comfortable about speaking about opportunity because it sounds glib when businesses today are faced, they find it difficult to open the door, keep the lights on. You know, they've got Brexit, they've got COVID, they've got the unknowns coming at them left, right and centre like a juggernaut. And all of a sudden they've got this confusing term being thrown at them. Well, you're going to have to be net zero by 2045. What? What does that mean? And, you, and that transition needs to be a just transition. Well, you've lost me even more now. So before you know it, you've got lots of businesses, unless they've got massive big compliance teams, and I'll come back to that, are over here going... Where do I start? What does this mean for me? Is this going to be more problems and more barriers? Is this going to be 
So what changed in Paris was the narrative went from, we're not going to talk about who's to blame, we're going to talk about who do we, instead of finding who to blame, find out who you can partner with to solve problems. And you started to see intergovernmental agreements between this country and that country. And suddenly the momentum of hope was building that the big guys thought, we need to get involved in this or we're going to be crowded out. Hence, Joe Biden comes into the scene. So Paris was a landmark moment. But for three or four years after Paris, it was the, the Trump era. And what happened was a lot of big countries and the big economies were going, maybe he's right, maybe he's on it. something, maybe we should reject climate change, maybe we should reject supporting the African nations, actually. But why would we bother? Let's focus on, you know, the Midwest. And, and suddenly you got an awful lot of people rejecting this whole narrative, and that was terrifying for me. I must admit, I don't normally get worried. But during those years, I just kept thinking, I actually kept me awake at night. I thought, what are we, where are we going with this, this journey? Because suddenly if you have more countries jumping on that, narrative, we are in a really bad place. So we stopped that, Paris got together, so we're going to speak about what do we have to gain, what's the climate opportunity, not the climate emergency, and how do we rally around and try and get some stuff done. And then these terms like net zero, which I, again I've explained is quite clever, it allows us to look at where businesses can't yet cut emissions because the technical solution isn't there, so can they get involved in, in working with nature, can use nature based solutions, well, of course they can. And it just so happens that Scotland has an abundance of nature. I would noted to tell you that in the beautiful south of Scotland here. But this nature-based solution, this natural capital, is still kind of resting in that conceptual space. But very, very soon, and I'm predicting maybe next year, it will be as real to you as pens, pounds and shillings. It will be a real asset that suddenly you can be able to access and deploy. I'm going to give you a scenario. Valenti Whiskey Firm. We are regulated by the Environment Protection Agency, CEPA, to a term called BAT, <coughs> Best Available Technique. I'm operating at BAT, so that means I can't do anymore. I'm at the best available technique globally. So that's the way it works. I don't know if you know that, but that's how it works. And then when they're at BAT, they get a compliance assessment score, which means you're pretty good. So what happens is, in theory, Valenti Distillers, by, by the way, it doesn't exist in case you're coming up later for a bottle of whiskey. Uh, I could sit back and go, well, put my hands in my pockets and look at you and go, these people are not pulling their weight. This sector over here is making a mess of things. Actually, I wonder if I'm wasting my time doing this. Maybe I should just, you know, let's just, just start doing what everyone else. But what we're trying to say to them is, is that these businesses, and it's real, it's not a theory, these businesses are saying, I'm at full compliance, but I want to do more. And I worked in the regulated agency for 17 years, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, CEPA. And 90% of my day was with businesses going, right, I'm at full compliance, but I'm still keen to do stuff. And I'm thinking, the joys, I've got, I've got Diageo and businesses like that saying, right, but what do we do now? What can we get involved in? And, and people who don't know those organisations would say, well, you can just cut your emission. I'm thinking, they've cut them as far as they can. They're down to the wire. There's literally nothing else they can do. And yet we have this abandoned nature on our hands, we've got peatland, the likes of, you know, in other countries, got people got 1.8 or 1.4 million hectares of peatland. That's gold dust around the world. Now, people are looking at peatland because the carp captures carbon, stores it for thousands of years if it's properly protected. But the problem is, and this is quite depressing to say, 80% of the peatlands in Scotland is degraded. So, in other words, it's not working. It's, it's ruined and it needs to be protected, and that costs money. And the public first can't afford it. Because if, if, if we try to protect peatland at the rate we're doing it, it's going to take 300 years. Emily, I don't know what your definition of a bit of climate emergency is, but 300 years doesn't cut it for me. So how do we as a nation say, how can we get involved to help us protect this peatland, cut their emissions, bless you, and grow their business and develop new markets? Think about that for a second. So that is a whole massive new area. If I was in one of your positions, I'd be sitting thinking, natural capital is the next big economic opportunity for me. I need to get a handle on it and I need to get a, a narrative on it and I need to think about, because if I've got those parts of my business I can't cut carbon emissions on, I'm going to get involved in nature until those carbon technologies exist. And some of them are quite far away. Hydrogen planes, for example, you can do the odd wee pilot here and there, but they are several years away. So I'd be saying to the aviation sector, you can do nothing for 10 years until somebody creates 
because they're coming at us all the time saying, how do we get involved in Scotland? How do we get involved in nature? How can we protect and enhance your environment? And it's difficult because, back to that point about collaboration versus combat, we created, I'm not saying you, but mm. us, we created a, a hostile environment for talking about climate change. The conversations about who, who's, whose fault was it anyway and who's to blame and, and who's not doing enough? Is, do we need a better regulatory system? Is the economies, the, econ the economists of Scotland not smart enough? Maybe businesses don't care. And because of that vague ambiguity, you get combat. You get our young people. Now, if this was a room full of people under 20, they'd be sitting going, and I'm not saying this cheekily, they'd be sitting going, you guys have all messed up. You, you haven't understood what's important. You're still chasing GDP and GVA, some mythological kind of metrics. But let me remind you, half of the country, or let's just even look at this area, not everybody's rich, not everybody has a, a good quality of life, not everybody has proper good food, not everybody can afford to put the heating on. There's something wrong with those metrics, if that's the case. So we need to change our values. Now, the beauty of net zero, to get to the point, is that creates this fantastic space where you can say, I know what my emissions are for my business, 10 tonnes a year, just using that for quickness. I can, I can cut five of them by energy efficiency, a heat pump here and a bit of technology there, but I've still got that space left. Now, I, do I sit back and wait until somebody creates something, or do I show a bit of leadership? Or do I be creative? Or do I find someone else I can work with? Or do I look at a piece of land, a piece of nature? Or do I look at supporting the local primary schools to educate kids? There are so many different things you can do in that net space. So use that uh, liberally and think about what you can do to tell the story of your business. It isn't just about cutting emissions. Because if you had to listen to Greta, right? I sound like I'm being tougher and I'm not. They did a great job. They raised the profile and they told us their house is on fire. And I'm going, yep, okay, somebody needs to put the fire out now. So who's going to do that? Standing with a clipboard saying down with that sort of thing. Ain't going to do it. So we're going to have to shift our activism into actionism. I just made that word up, Emily, because it sounds good, doesn't it? You can have that one. Uh, so we need to shift the people now into going, somebody should do something about that. Do you know what? I'm going to do something about it. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to offer support. So here's another idea I, I was thinking about. Everybody comes to events like this and they're, they're looking for something. Whether it's a bit of knowledge or it's a bit of a contact, which is, all these things are great. But it is usually to get a wee hand up or a wee light, a wee... Here's a, here's a different idea. Back to Christiana Figuera who's changed the narrative. Come to these events and offer support to someone else. Look at the people next to you and say, listen, we, we, we did do a bit of a, a case study with Zero Waste Scotland or someone else, and we have managed to save a bit of money in our waste or, or whatever. Do you want me to send that report to you? Can I give you a bit of help? I think the more we start to engender a network of people looking at each other to see who we can help rather than to see who we can blame, you're going to suddenly see the momentum and the narrative shifting and, and the actions increasing. So Scotland, I'm quite proud of Scotland because we do, you know, punch above our weight. You might not know this, and again, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't because it's glib to show off. But we cut our emissions and grew our economy at the same time faster than any country in the G20. Do let that rest in your head for it. Have they, else, have they heard that before? It's a staggering achievement. And uh, I was involved in a group called the 2020 Climate Group back in 2009 at Copenhagen, and we there launched the world's highest climate change target. Scotland launched the world's highest climate change targets, an interim <coughs> target of 42% emissions reduction by 2020. This is 2021, and we're sitting on 50, 51. That's astounding. So we basically have to emissions since 1990. That is an incredible achievement, and I'm pretty sure the world hasn't ended as a consequence of that. I'm pretty sure the businesses are still surviving. I'm pretty sure we've ad adapted and, and augmented the business to sort that, to live to that. But the next big push, the next nine years, is going to be seismic. It's going to be terrifying because we have to cut our emissions from 1990, uh, 75%. So that is, that's a huge, big leap. And, I'm, and I can't underestimate that. It's huge. It's massive. But we've done it before. We've done great leaps like that before by having, you know, the guts to have a goal where others are still sitting back waiting to see what happens. So it's leadership. One of the things that I did find out about COP was is that Scotland's loved by many world leaders, Joe Biden, Obama, everyone was all everything they were speaking about, they're speaking about Scotland, they're saying this is the best country in the world to be in because you guys are walking the walk. 
and you're talking the talk and you're living the life and you're doing it. And again, they know about the G20 figure because that's their life, it's not ours, but it's theirs. So they were coming here, they couldn't wait to get here. And they, when they got here, they couldn't wait to see you. They couldn't wait to see, well, who are these businesses that are bucking the trend? Who are these businesses that are transitioning their, 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 their business ideas? And there's thousands of them. Emily knows. I, I, I'm on social media almost every single day. I am that sad. And I promised myself a while ago when I was sick to death of hearing people going, all I hear is blah, blah, blah. And I was pulling my hair out going, that's not Scotland. I'm afraid Scotland is activate, activate, activate. I know you're going to hear from one soon. Businesses who face the same challenges as everyone else, but for something's inside them that's saying, there's an opportunity here that I'm going to be getting in front of. I'm not going to be waiting to be disrupted. I'm not going to be the blockbuster video in the Spotify world, right? I'm not going to sit and incrementally trying to prove my business. Meanwhile, everyone else is shooting past me. I'm going to be the business that's doing the disruption. And when you take that leadership role, you get support. That's the, that's the, the funny part of it. You go to the regulated agency, CEPA, Nature Scott, or South of Scotland Enterprise, and you come with a big idea, and we will do everything we can to try and make it work. Involved reaching out to other agencies that, 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 that maybe you don't know about, and we'll, we'll tap on the shoulder saying, can you come and help here? This is a great idea that, we'll repl that we can replicate. So I usually all sound quite upbeat, but the, the kind of tough part of it is, and Emily's going to tell me when to stop talking because I've a couple of minutes, right? Is that even though all those great things are happening, here's a stark fact. Every country gets its global footprint done by the Global Footprint Networks. It's a mad genius called Mathis Wackernagel. Don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> and he's in Geneva, and he gives every country the global the, the footprint, which is, here's your ecological footprint. Scotland, if everyone in the world lived like we like living here, we'd need two and a half planets. Now, the last time I checked, and I'm on safe scientific ground here, there's just the one. So that is a massive over-demand on supply. Now, in a business narrative, that might sound good. It's think, like, wow, I've only got 10 buses, but somebody's just ordered 50. But the reality kicks in about, well, hold on a minute here. I either realise the opportunity in front of us or I collapse, at the, the op a collapse because of it, the size and the scale of it. Now, a lot of what's happened in the past is people go, two and a half planets, one, it's too big, it's too much for us, we can't get involved, we're off. And, and, it's, and it's no surprise that some businesses feel it's overwhelming, but we, again, back to that point, in that decade, 2008 to 18, we doubled, we, we grew our economy and half their emissions. And I've said that twice now, but I, I've thought people would have been whooping about that, because very rarely do you hear great things about Scotland. Okay, our football team are doing pretty good at the moment. But that is unbelievable. I sat at meetings <coughs> with had Mark Carney and world leaders at it, and they were all quoting Scotland, they were all looking. So you might not know it, but you're under the spotlight there. 200 world leaders and thousands of, you know, Bloomberg Finance, all of these companies were looking, going, who are these people? What are they doing? How did they do it? Why did they do it? And I would advocate the, the, the why you do it is because we can, because we should. We were part of giving the world these industrial revolutions, whether they wanted that or not. Uh, we also gave the world this slightly wonky economic system. So it's payback time. So as a nation, we've got a, a duty to come back out with this revised economic system and what's been done on it at the moment. The, the Finance Cabinet Secretary, Ms Forbes, pulled together a team, I'm calling them the Avengers Assemble for Economy, and it's got real, real provocative economists on there. Mariana Mazzucato, all of these kind of people. These people are being charged to create a new economic model for Scotland. So watch out for that, it's going to be fantastic. Because that then suddenly makes a lot of what we're trying to do easier because they understand it. So I know there may be questions later on, but I, I, I do come across as being quite kind of hopeful about it all because I've lived through, I've been here for, I've been involved in a lot of cops and they all were kind of, so what? Paris was just dead exciting. It was like, oh my God, this is something. Trump came, held it back for a while, but now, it's an unstoppable movement. Everyone now, it, there's, I think there's two thirds of the world's nations have a net zero transition plan. Scotland's is pretty good, 2045, it's not bad. It doesn't excite me that much, 2045. Finland is 2030, Norway 2040. So are we really saying the best we can hope for is to be 10 years behind other countries? We're going to, we're to be losing mojo, I don't know. But for me, at that target should be 2035, because that then creates a narrative and it creates an ambition. And when you're ambitious, ambitious people come and look at you and see how they can get involved. 
And this was called the No Excuse Cop because we have the innovation. A lot of the solutions to solve the problems exist right now. I could point to them all day long. And what was missing from previous cops was money. Not this time. The world uh, former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, who's now the U UN finance ambassador, brought a team to Glasgow and I mean, and I sat in it and just wept with joy. And they brought the G fans, the Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero, you can maybe put a link onto them. And they came with thirty trillion dollars worth of investment and they were on the eye for companies and businesses and nations. And who's got who's got ideas? Who's got who, who's up for this? Who's going to wait and be blockbuster? And who's the Spotify in this story? And I think they went away clearly understanding what Scotland's ambition was. So there's a lot to play for. We shouldn't be, and this is the Glasgow word, I do apologise for people down here, feared, which means afraid. We shouldn't be afraid. We have the ambition, we have the finance, we have the innovation, and we get Emily, which that should probably just be enough. So <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that for the time being, but my reflections about COP26 was you got the television version of it and it was all this, the activity. <coughs> Honestly, just see beyond that. Some of these meetings that I was at, some of these round tables, people were saying, we are looking at you, we want to be here. You know, Phoenix Group, Bloomberg, BlackRock, they're coming, they've got massive amounts of money and they're looking to see what country's got ambition. A country itself can't have ambition. It's the businesses within a country that sets that ambition level. If you become very, very ambitious and constantly prodding governments saying you need to do more, we think you should think bigger, we think you should act faster, we think you should get on with it and then get out of the way, I think you'll see quite a, a change in the system. So thank you for the invite. Um, never come to do presentations because I'm not smart enough. It's just a, more of a proposition. And the proposition is, let's make the climate emergency a climate opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Martin. That, that, was, that was great. Um, we're going to move on in a moment to talk about one or two more local um, approaches, local businesses and, and things that we think are sort of more local scale. But before we do, have we got some questions that anybody would like to, to throw in to, to Martin? Yeah, so what does net zero mean t to you as, as a business? Opportunity or worry? I could be Good honest, we're in a room of friends here. I must admit, if I just watched the TV, and, uh, I would be worried because it just looks like Climageddon everywhere you look, it just looks costly and expensive. And climate change is sold to us as a cliff edge. But here's a narrative that you can think about. Instead of saying cliff edge, but it's no one would jump off, think about it as a mountain. Equally dangerous and equally perilous. But they like climbing mountains. In fact, the bigger the mountain, the, the more they enjoy it. So there's something about shifting the narrative from this is a problem to manage or an opportunity to exploit. And as businesses, I would have thought that's right up your street. So that's what it should mean to you. Opportunity beyond your wildest dreams. Lots and lots of opportunities. Sorry. Does anybody want to say nothing? As in, not sit silently, but in response to the question, uh, so you mean nothing to you, my business? Well, <coughs> sorry. I've got a small shop in town, and it's been there for quite a long time. Um, so I don't know. How can I improve it, or what can I do to to make things? Because you know, it's one small shop. I don't do online sales. Um, what does it mean? So, what are you really proud about your shop? What's the thing that makes you feel most proud? Um, I think it's quality, really. Do you intentionally sell stuff that's damaging the environment? No. Yeah. Well, that shouldn't that that makes you feel proud, doesn't it? it does, so yeah, shout yeah. about it. You know, I would be branding, I would be joining all sorts of social media, I'd speak to Emily and get help in that, and they just start speaking about, if you want to do the right thing, and if you want to be part of a, a global transition to the next zero, come and shop here. And I know it sounds cheesy, but everyone is on that now. If he's, how many adverts have you seen TV lately for a car that wasn't an electric one? How many holidays have you seen TV lately that doesn't say a net zero holiday? How many biscuits can you buy these days that don't? It is the narrative of the future, and I, I'm not going to sound flippant here, but you either own it or it owns you. And when I mean it owns you, they'll go, you're probably not a good business, maybe you should leave. And we did that in the 70s with the coal sector. We said, you probably finished now, you should leave. And they did. But they left massive social, economic, environmental decline across the country. You only need to drive into a former mining town, you see it says it's hard to sold it to. So let's not do that again. Let's take the narrative from net zero, make it ours, but then we have to give the world the economy, economic system, so let's go back and give them a revised one. 
and make your business centre to it. So that's what I'd be doing. So I would probably go back to your marketing material tomorrow <laughs> and start and start shouting about the stuff that makes you feel good about having that shop. The chances are that's what your customers want as well. Thank you. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Because it is. <laughs> Any other? Anyone else? Did you make you do make it sound so easy, but there's a, an area of teaching younger people yeah. and getting the government to put in that system of education. Yeah. You're not starting at the beginning. No. So here's a great statistic for you. They keep Scotland Beautiful is an environmental charity, and they do the green flag school for schools. The eco. You've maybe driven by a friend of school and you've seen a big green flag. Wonder what that was. That is astounding. That means they're young ones from that age have got environmental awareness and credentials and they're very, very savvy, the kids, right? And there's five, five point, uh, 5,700 schools in Scotland, which all these kids are. So in future meetings like this, this stuff will be bread and butter to them. Just, you know, it will be just normal practice for them. They, this is their default position. Yeah, but what sort of money are you putting in as well as the green flag? The governments. I'm not, I don't work for the government, unfortunately. No, but this is the trouble. Yeah. You're floating above what's really needed with the government supplying, whether it's the Scottish yeah. or the English. I can quote the Scottish government for, for you for exactly, because we were on a meeting just the other day with the Scottish government and we asked that question, it's a brilliant question, so we said, it's all very well and good, but how do we make this happen? And they then, so we, we passed them to go away and come back with a list, and I'm happy to share that with Emily, and she can maybe share it with you. And the last figure, for the next four years, there's £4.3 billion pounds worth of funds set aside to help businesses and society transition to net zero. That's a significant amount of money in Scotland. But the, but the challenge I've always said and I always try to be honest about it is the mindset used to shift from it's someone else's problem to actually I want to get involved in it. I was that point you said yourself, Mark, it's about you've got a shop, you do but everyone's involved in this maybe maybe they just don't realise it. But there's no there's no shortage of money. Yes, is it easy though with access to it? No it's not. No. But that's maybe where Chambers can come in handy. Chambers can maybe do some, I'm just landing you and stuff here. But maybe <laughs> maybe you can be the babble fish for funding. Maybe you can translate. Here is the funds that can allow you to do A, B, C, D, E, F and G. Because it's out there. It just takes a bit of work to, to distill it. But it is there. And it is there in abundance. There is so much money out there. But you've got to competitively fight other people to get that money to make it sound as if it's a game. Yeah. Instead of it being on the walls of buildings saying so much is available. Yeah. It's all theoretical but not in front of our faces. Well maybe that's that's a good uh, thing that chambers and yeah, bodies yeah, like chambers yeah. can do is that de demystify the funding because you're right, it isn't easy. If you yeah. had to Google it now, funds for putting in changing my car to electric, you've got all sorts of stuff. So maybe you can do yeah. sorry Emily. That's <laughs> fine. I think this is the whole point of this and that's why we put that question because I think Everything that you said, nobody would disagree with anything you said. I really <coughs> like the whole combative thing because I've never heard that before and you're absolutely right. But there is a gulf between you standing up there and you having been in Glasgow and Ian and his pottery business, yes. you know, and I think the reason we want to put this section on is because we want to close that. And if it is about demystifying, it does feel intimidating and complex and for other people, not for me, so yeah. It's a, it's a great question, you know, everybody is, but, it, but it's something, so I think Emily's now got a big action there, and I've seen her underline it and put an asterisk at it, is how do you take this theory and make it real, and how do you make it easy for people? Just for information, my agency, South Scotland Enterprise, that's what, I'm only 127 days or something in the job, and my new start is just sitting behind you there, Mr Paul Wheelhouse, as some of you may or may not remember, was a former minister for the environment and energy and all sorts of stuff. So that shows you how seriously we're taking it. We want to make sure that we're bringing together the people and the expertise to make exactly your question easier. And we're going to be working with them when people you know, across the, the, both regions to make sure that we can do that. So watch this space. Give, sure. give <coughs> me the details so you can, you can check, check on it. I'll move on to the next question, yeah. but can I just add one point to that, which I think is a really, really important issue. I think it, it is very confusing for people individually to look for sources of advice because there, there are so many and you never quite know who you should go to, and you start trawling through websites, you can, you can rapidly lose the will to live because there are so many 
source of advice. We really do need to find a way of making that advice easier to find and, and somebody to guide you to where the most relevant information we is. We encourage you to tell you that just in my short time in the South of Scotland Enterprise, we've, we've asked, in fact, demanded in a nice way, the other economic family, Scottish Enterprise and Highland Island Enterprise, we've now worked together on a project with the Data Lab to create one, one version of the truth and it's a self-assessment app or a something, we'll try and figure out the best way to reach you guys and we'll ask Emily to help us test it with you and it's about where are you, what's the next first step, who can help and it's a very, very, very clear signposting system. So, but it's, it's weird that it's taking me to come in and go, I can't understand why you can't get this information. So you're absolutely spot on with your question, sir. But we're on it. Can't Great. Think. So I'm going to ask this question for somebody who uh, was meant to be here but hasn't been able to attend. Um, it's another small business in town, very long established. The uh, method of running the business has not changed for generations, so and it's not considered kind of high carbon emissions mm -hmm. in business. And I think to the, the business owner, it feels again what you were saying with like, um, other people. But it's, it's easy to identify other people that are probably much more guilty. So why do our businesses have to change if, if generally they're not doing too much that's wrong already? Well, if they're not doing too much that's wrong already, they should try and figure out again, maybe with your help, try and figure out how you <laughs> how, how do you narrate your story? Like your father, how do you narrate your story so that you're maybe net zero? You you could be net zero right now. I don't know that. But but you maybe don't know that, but as your I'm just throwing this out here, as your electricity su supplier for your bills, are they are they hundred percent electric uh, renewable? So that's one. Is your waste picked up and collected and recycled completely or do you still put stuff in the the bin? That's the, these simple things and by the time if you do some quick analysis you might end up saying, We're net zero. And if you are, sell it, sell it, sell it, because that is going to be people in there. I've got an app and I'm going to tell you I buy my whiskey and wine and stuff like that, like most people do. I'm not teetotal. I wouldn't believe it. And I'll check the credentials of these businesses before I give them a penny of my money. I want to make sure they've got the ethical, they've got the fair work, they've got all of that. And then I'll buy stuff from them. And, and the pottery may be the same. People may be, why would I buy from you and not from this other one who uses, who's net zero? So it's going to be, unfortunately, it's going to sound negative, but you will either going to be successful in the future, a business in the 21st century being successful, or one that people spoke about that used to be on the high street years ago. Remember that shop? So you've got to just suddenly make that. So back to that, what do I have to change? The mindset. Yeah. The mindset that this isn't an opportunity for you because it is. So that's the first thing I would say. So is there some sort of app or something that we can look at to see? That was the question that Pip mentioned. It's, there are. I mean, you could. I could get you 10 right now. Edinburgh Science have a net zero toolkit, uh, Zero Waste Scotland have a net zero toolkit, Community Energy Scotland, Development Trust Association got, I could list them all day long, so you can pick one which suits you, maybe your own sector, I don't know what sector you're in, Madden, but maybe your sector already has one, so like whiskey, anyone involved in distillers, Scots Whiskey Association have one they use, Scottish salmon producers have one they use, so you may have a sector one that you can get for free, Scottish and uh, South of Scotland Enterprise, we're going to be creating that one very soon, hopefully, that every single business in Scotland will be benchmarked against the same standard. Just like food safety, just like health and safety. Uh, and, and it's taken us, to be fair, to, to say to Scotland, maybe we should do this together rather than fragmented and they've listened so it's terrific. Mm -hmm. That was done. How do I make a change? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to ask the upward race course um, and we were thinking, okay, so how do you, how do you actually make things change? Um, just to give you a little example, this isn't to do with the race course particularly, but um, 30 years ago, my mother would actually wash all of her plastic bags and she would reuse them. So she, she had got a plastic polythene bag, wash it, reuse it. And she would reuse her freezer bags dozens and dozens of times. Um, and over that sort of 30, 40 years since then, actually, we've just seen Graphs and graphs of disposable, particularly, you know, we talk about plastic a lot, but disposable uh, merchandise and disposable packaging and, and, and all sorts of things. And it strikes me that an awful lot of it is because it's convenient. Yeah. You know, so, so people love convenience and we're, we're hooked on convenience. And uh, I think as businesses, naturally, we serve the, our customers 
we give them what they want, and quite often that's an that's yeah. easy option. If you if you I, you know I'm amazed that 40 years ago somebody came up with the idea that you should make plastic containers which don't degrade and put everything in them, and then you know that's a good way to sell stuff. But it happened because it was cheap and people found it easy. So how do we change if actually all the solutions aren't just as convenient and just as simple for people to um, adopt? It's a good question, but I'd rather quote, so, uh, so I'm renting in Moffat, and I bought a house in Duffy's, don't move in yet, but I'm renting in Moffat, I didn't know much about Moffat. But the first thing I spotted, but there's a shop where I take in my stuff and they can, so I take in bags, you, you, what's, the, what's the name of the shop, do you know what, Pip? It's funny in Lord as well now. So I just go in with my empty container and they give me my washing up like they get, it's fantastic. So I have no waste, literally going out, I take that tub in and I fill it up and I take the tub. And actually, old supermarkets used to do that. Remember Fine Fair, anyone? Him, the old one from Remember yes. Fine Fair? No, you're all far too young. But I remember Fine Fair. And they had the pick and mix. It was tubs you would get your lentils. And you, so you didn't have to generate that stuff. You are absolutely right. If you could turn back the clock and stop that idiotic simplicity and stuff like that. But the problem is, it happened. But now we're seeing the consequence of that. Of almost 80% of fish and seafoods have microplastics in them. That's those plastic bags that are convenient, but they're now causing real challenges. So now you can't unknow what you know. So we now know that some of those convenient things weren't very smart, they weren't very clever, and they, they caused problems, and those problems are going to resonate for a, for a very, very, very long time. But now that we know that, we're not going to do that anymore. So now we're going to go back to what you, you said your mum was doing. So go back to the future. Is that not a movie? So go back <laughs> to think about how we can develop. And I think that's a, that's a bright idea for shops. Bright idea for business, it's a bright idea for the race course, it's a bright idea. So if you're cutting the grass, do you use the grass for something else? You know, there's always little techniques you can do. Every single business can be sustainable to some degree, and it's sometimes it's the very first simple step. And again, the first one is, and it's the one I always find amusing energy efficiency. Do not waste your energy, it's expensive. And yet, you go into homes, you, oh, I'm sick of this. If you any thermostats, no, you're going, I can't help. If you can't even think that something as simple and as cheap and as easy to put in like that isn't going to help you, there are very, very simple things. Stop wasting food. When was the last time you were in a somewhere and you didn't eat all your meal in a restaurant? I'm Italian, so that doesn't happen to us. We eat a lot. I actually find myself eating my neighbour's dish if they've finished with it. But we waste food, we waste energy, we waste resources, and, and that's just beyond belief. So we need to stop those sort of things. And again, back in your mum and my mum's day, <coughs> didn't happen. So maybe let's think about going with it backwards. And please take the sandwiches and scones home. <laughs> <laughs> take, take them all home, otherwise I'm taking them all. My wife will be in a scone for the next four months. So our next speaker is Alistair Cameron, who's managing director of Scott Mass, local company, that, um, I've got, I hope I've got this right, produces water purification, hygiene and disinfection products. Disinfecting products? Disinfection, right? Anyway. Alistair, tell us what you're, you've managed to do locally. Thank you very much. I'm not quite sure how I follow the evangelical excellence of Martin. It's uh, <laughs> quite, a, quite a daunting prospect. Um, I'm going to try and bring things back down a level and try and bring things back to the, the, the practical um, and the, the involved things. Um, a lot of people in Kelso um, probably don't know who we are. Um, we're a small family business, um, started off by my father, um, 23 years ago, uh, it was a home-based business based down in Point of Place, just down the road from here. Um, and over that time, uh, we've grown to now employ just touching on 60 people, and we now occupy the what many of you will know as the former Board of Precision Building um, up at Pinnacle Hill. Um, very few people know what we do, um, because around 95-96% of our work is out with Scotland. Uh, we manufacture uh, disinfectant products um, which are used in all sorts of markets from healthcare to <coughs> drinking water and we also make um, some machines which add that disinfectant into your drinking water and the particular type of thing we make is an environmentally friendly alternative to chlorine. So you'll, you'll all have your Scottish water leaflets in your pack there the machines that we make um, here in Kelso treat, I think, one and a half times the annual consumption of Scottish water. It's just that we do it in 
parts of the Middle East, India, Africa, and, and nobody in Scotland really knows what we do. So that's a brief introduction to us. Um, and how we got onto the Net Zero was, uh, journey was part of a, a wider initiative we were trying to, to take forward in, in the company. As I say, we're a family business, we're rooted in the local community, um, we want to do the right thing wherever we can. So we have three terms, people, planet, profit. Um, we're a commercial business, we're not a cooperative, we're not um, out for the good of the planet. I, I do look to try and make a, a, a good profit at the end of the year, but at the end of the day, we don't want to do it by either harming our community or the environment. So net zero is very current. COP26 has put net zero right up there, but it's part of a much bigger picture. You can be net zero and you can be the worst environmental polluter in the world and Martin's former colleagues in the CEPA will be all over you. So it, it, please don't think about this as, a, a, as an entirely net zero conversation. It's around fair work. It's around um, doing the right thing by the environment. So this is all part of a, of a bigger picture for us. Um, some of our largest clients, um, getting back to net zero, um, are governments, large organisations like the NHS, um, and uh, other big organisations. So the question was asked earlier on, one, one of the questioners, why should I do this? Well, the Scottish Government announced, I think just over a month ago, that there would be a mandate for any public sector supply contracts that they would have both a commitment to fair work and a commitment to net zero. So if anybody doesn't see that as a big train coming around the track, just like being CFC free fridges where in my youth 20 years ago, or uh, anything else, it's coming, and it's coming big style. So some of our biggest clients are already asking us, where's your net zero plan? Okay. And that will eventually work its way down to, will I stay at the Cross Keys Hotel, unless they have a, a, a net zero certification. I can assure you that's coming, because we're seeing it on a week in, week out basis from our clients. Um, to the extent that, and I have one of my colleagues, Kevin, who's hiding at the back there, who's our dedicated environmental and safety manager just dealing with these types of inquiries and trying to help us be on the front foot um, to do whatever we can. So, how did we start with the net zero journey? I absolutely heard the comments about, this is so confusing, I don't know where to look. I made the mistake of Googling it. <laughs> Massive mistake. Um, so many apps, so many ways of working, so many... Um, differing theories, arguments on forums around what is net zero, is net zero actually a, a good thing to do? I think I went down something like a 3D rabbit hole before I, I tore out what little hair that I had left. And I ended up phoning some friends, which again, Martin mentioned and Emily mentioned about the, the sense of community in Kelso and helping each other out. We, for the past nine months, have been on a, a very <laughs> um, wavy journey in terms of what we were doing around net zero was energy efficiency in our building enough? Do we look at travel? How do we classify that? What do we do about things that aren't in our control? So we've done a lot of research and we're very, very happy to share that with any local businesses who would like to get in touch. Um, Kevin at the back there is um, absolutely our, our expert, but please feel free to, to get in touch with us and we'll, we'll certainly share whatever we have in file uh, and help you along that line. I'm very, very hopeful that South Scotland Enterprises um, all singing, all dancing app will help to provide that clarity because ultimately in a few years time I think that's what governments and others will look to you when you go to SOSA for grant funding or any other form of assistance they're going to ask you these questions so it's better to be on the front foot and start looking at just now. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what we did. I hope by the time you come to do this if you've not done it, that things will be a little bit smoother, but it might be helpful that you understand the, the processes that we've gone through. My principle is what gets measured gets done. And if you don't measure it, you don't do it, you, you hide away. So the first part of our journey was pulling out our gas and electric bills, doing essentially an audit. If you make the mistake as I did of Googling things, you'll hear about things called scope one, two, and three. Um, carbon emissions and it's actually a pretty decent place to start. What do I do that em emits CO2? What does somebody else do that I've got direct control of do that emits carbon? And 
what have I got absolutely no control over? If I want to go and live as a hermit in a yurt somewhere up in the hills, then I can eliminate this. But if I want to actually carry on my daily business and create that economic activity, then I've got no choice. So that's things like the carbon that's embedded in the plastic that we use to make our machines. There is no alternative to do it. That comes into scope three. There's a process of documenting it out. Now we're, as a business, we're probably only got to scope one and two because that's the stuff that we control. Like any business, you pick off the low hanging fruit first. So we've looked at a series in our direct emissions around our heating. Very simple thing. Can we insulate better? Can we cut the amount of heating? Can we reconfigure our factory? Can we put in fans to recirculate the heat so we don't have to fire up those gas burners um, more? So scope two, again, what do we have influence on? I have gas and electric supply. Can I use a renewables only tariff as an example? Can I put up a solar panel instead? What's my economic return on that solar panel? And then as a business of still have, you know, a small business by the global scale, but with a reasonable amount of purchasing power with some of our suppliers, can we now go out and look at what others are doing for us? One of the things that we looked at in Scope 3 was commuting. Um, we did an exercise with our staff and we discovered that out of our 50-odd staff on site in Kelso, we were travelling 250,000 miles a year just to get to and from Kelso. Okay, that's not really in my direct control, that's my staff member, but what can we do about that? Can we promote car sharing, obviously, uh, in the post-COVID environment? Can we look at public transport? Probably not, in the Scottish borders. Um, but what else can we do? And we came up with a, a, a few innovative schemes, which uh, I'll touch on a little bit later. But that, that is essentially the, the approach that we take. Scope one, scope two, scope three. What's in my control? What am I doing? What is somebody else essentially doing on my behalf? And what can't I control at all? It's just a natural part of doing business and might take some longer term thinking. Out of that, what gets measured gets done. I can tell you that today um, we are emitting 31.9 tonnes of carbon per year as a result of on-site generation. Okay, that's a number that I can now deal with that as a business person. I can deal with that in the same way as I deal with my profit and loss. There's that carbon emission. Can I change that to some alternative that has no cost effect or a minimal cost effect and do something better? And it's, it's a business process. And we're beginning to deal with carbon accounting just like we're beginning to deal with financial accounting. We also try and hold ourselves to account. So we, are, we have committed to publishing, um, as part of our annual accounts, a carbon report. Now, if your business turns over, I think, £36 million a year, the government make, and actually makes you do this. It's called a SECR report. But we've essentially taken the same format and we want our, to hold ourselves to the higher standards. And again, me as a managing director, I'm responsible to my shareholders on an annual basis to say, have we met our carbon emission targets? It's nothing particularly fancy, but we feel that it's, it's the right thing to do to actually track our progress. And it may well be that as our business expands, as we hope it will do, our carbon emissions may increase, but at least it, we're accounting for it in the same way as we're accounting for it in prop. What measure gets done? If you just come away from this meeting and you don't actually <coughs> look at your own numbers, probably as business people, you're, you're doing the wrong thing and you're not actually serious about this. So I'd encourage people to look at the numbers uh, first if you can. It's a common thing, I, I, I have a four-year-old kid and uh, they're getting bombarded with kids' TV about reduce, reuse, recycle, as well as other areas of, of um, energy use. Think about the life cycle of your products um, and what you're doing. What can re you reuse? Try and think creatively uh, around it. And also try and use the tools that are available. So, as I say, um, so we are, are bringing out an app, but in the meantime, there's resources out there. Zero Waste Scotland um, have some fantastic tools that are linked. I'm sure Martin will as, as circulate some others. The one that we've used is Carbon Expert, www.cbn.expert, that allows you to put in things like your total mileage and actually get a carbon uh, output at the end, put in your electric. It helps to, you to turn the numbers that you should be familiar with 
like how much do I spend on electric and gas every year and you'll get a carbon number out at the end of it. It might not be 100% accurate, but it's a start. It's something that you as a business person can, can work from. So we're not going into huge amounts of detail, but it's a start. Now we as a business um, had a great achievement last year and we ended up on a Zero Waste Scotland case study because we cut our carbon emissions by 31%. Great, fantastic, aren't we great? No, we, we actually ended up doing the easy stuff. Um, I don't think that that 31% drop in carbon emissions was actually um, a particularly good feat because we did the easy stuff, we picked off the low hanging fruit. Um, we changed various things that I'll, I'll go into to later on. The real work for us comes with that next 60% because that's actually the, the hard stuff. And that's where we're going to people like Martin to say, look, can you help us here? Um, if we have to make investments in changing our heating, for example. So we have a 30,000 square foot factory that's currently fired by gas burners. Now, economically, it doesn't make sense for me to change that to a heat pump. Can't be done. It, 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 they pay back something like 30 years. Um, so what else can we do? You begin to have the conversations and you begin to make judgments. OK, I can't change that gas heater, but you know what? I can do this elsewhere. So you know, Martin talked to you about the net zero opportunity. It's around quantifying your effect on the environment is about quantifying your carbon emissions and making a sensible business-led decision. So I believe we're going to talk later on about some of the help that's out there so I won't touch on it too much but in our process before we got to this stage we got to this stage which is a report from Zero Waste Scotland. It's available to every business um, in Scotland um, and it will entail an advisor coming out doing a carbon audit of your building your heating, your processes, and they'll give you some very simple numbers that are um, immediately actionable. Also, they'll advise you on what you can do. So, you'll not see it in this picture, but now the front of our factories is adorned with solar panels. What the Zero Waste Scotland report was able to tell us was, Alistair, you can spend £60,000 on some solar panels, and it will give you a payback within six and a half years based on climate conditions and Kelso, et cetera, et cetera. Or you could change the renewals only tariff, or you can do this. And again, it gives me the information that I can make a sensible business decision on. The other beauty of this is that we accessed 100,000 pounds or up to 100,000 pounds of zero interest funding from Zero Waste Scotland in order to make those carbon efficiency measures. Martin touched on earlier, the help is there if you look for it, if you know where to find it. But some of it is the best kept secret of, of the public sector. So only by having the conversations, asking for the help, quantifying the number, and going to those agencies to ask for um, that information will you get the help, but it is absolutely achievable. So for Scott Mass, um, our, our journey is uh, only just beginning. Uh, yeah, yes, we've made a, an impressive 31% now, but the hard stuff comes over the next three years. I've made a very uh, public commitment in our business to our, our customers that we're going to be a net zero business by 2025. Um, and the real pain for us is going to come in that over the next three years where we, we make some tough decisions about um, what we do, how we do it, or how we use our talents and abilities to, to offset that number. So we're not offsetting yet, because we took the decision that actually we want to get our own house in order first. Um, it's actually very easy to carbon offset. There's websites you can go to and there'll be gold accredited standard this and I'll go and uh, you know, plant a rainforest in, in uh, South America. And a lot of companies are taking that, what I would term to be a, a, an easy route out. Um, and I personally, uh, it's an individual decision, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I want to try and do as much as I can to make uh, my business and this community as sustainable and, and uh, environmentally forward thinking as possible. When it gets to the point that actually, Alistair, there's only so much you can do, 
uh, you go to use this much plastic, then we can think about how we can support, use our talents. You know, we're in the disinfection sector. Can I use my uh, talents and my products to apply those products elsewhere that are going to have a net carbon saving? But those are conversations much further down the line. And I suspect for most businesses in this area, they'll still be at that early stage. So for me, personal advice would be get your house in order first, see what's left, and then think about offsetting as being the, the, the next sta stage down the line. So, some of the things we've achieved just briefly, so we talked about the 250,000 miles um, done by our, our employees getting to and from work. There's some fantastic schemes now around um, Love Electric, which allows you to um, essentially uh, fund a new electric car on the same basis as the bike to work scheme. So you essentially see between 30 to 40% of the cost of an electric car. You'll see a Volkswagen ID3 that's parked outside, which is happily funded by me for um, from Love Electric. I think it costs something like £210 a month. I was probably spending that on diesel, travelling to and from my house in Melrose every day. So fantastic saving, well worth looking into. Um, other schemes are available, but um, that, again, is one of those best hidden sectors in the if you're paying yourself through payroll, you can get a cheap electric car very, very easily. <coughs> solar panels, say we've put up 85 kilowatt hours of uh, solar panels this year. We expect to put in a further 85 kilowatts uh, next year. But again, we've got an app and it tells me exactly what my return on investment is. It tells me whether that's worthwhile and I'll be able to make a reasoned business case um, to do that next year. We've looked at recycling plastic. Uh, during the height of the COVID pandemic, I chartered half of a Boeing 767 to fly empty bottles from China to Kelso. And I swore that I would never do that again. So in that same plane came a bottle blowing machine, which means that we can now use recycled plastic, recycled PET plastic from drinks bottles to make the bottles <coughs> in Kelso, which means that we don't have trucks coming up and down the road um, with full of air. Full of air. Um, there's a variety of things that you can do. I was actually amazed when this infographic was put together about everything we'd been able to achieve uh, within a year. And probably the net cost to our business with the finance and the assistance that we've had to do it has been pretty negligible. As I say, we've got a harder three years ahead of us to try and get into some of those more, more gnarly issues. But you know, one of the slides earlier was, what can we do? Well, if you look close enough, if you start quantifying what you're doing, and you start dealing with it as a business case, like you would do your profit and loss, then you'll find that there are savings out there and everyone can make a difference. So thanks for your time. Uh, so, firstly, I think um, infographics are so impactful for the very reason we out of everything. That has just been a reason, so that's fantastic to see that. Um, and really commend you because I think in some regards a chemical company could seem like the very antithesis of what a sustainable company should be, so I think that's great. Um, but one of the reasons that I specifically asked you to speak tonight is because I obviously know you and your dad in the business. Um, wind it back to just when it was you and your dad, how how feasible would it have been for you to have gone on this journey when you were a two-man band? Yeah. It very, you know, I was very fortunate in that I had a Kevin who was able to, to say, be dedicated in, into the role and say, go and look at those figures. And you know, Martin's been throwing challenges at you. That's a challenge for Martin and his colleagues in the public sector is to make this stuff simple. Um, we had an incredibly winding road, a, an incredible journey on trying to get these things quantified and we had a, a huge amount of learning. The amount of jargon that's out there because there's so much enthusiasm around the net zero journey unfortunately that has a byproduct that every organ every organization and their dog wants to be that or and they all have their own spin on it so as the end user you know I, you know regardless of winding it back to when we were a two four five person business um, a, a 60 person business we were confused so it, it's it's around choosing what's right and for me, I got clarity when I started distilling it back to a business decision and started to treat carbon like 
you know, pounds and pence uh, and, and dealing with it that way. Um, I, I fully expect that things will get a lot easier um, as things goes on. But netzero.scot is a, a developing but very good website. They've just put on some additional resources around there in terms of links to other tools and, and apps that are out there. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, you, you, you can end up in a technical argument with a, a, a low carbon enthusiast as to whether something's scope one or scope two. Who cares? You're doing something. You're starting down the journey. You're having the conversations. Things will get refined um, as they go along, but start now uh, and start quantifying things now if you can. And Maggie. I hope you don't mind I took a photo of your infographic. I'll, I'll email you the link to you more than welcome. I think it's really, uh, it's, it's a really positive tool. It's like a mind map. You know, it's so hard for us to um, hold all the information in our heads, the, the, the scope of what it is that's possible. There it is there. And that must be useful for you as a tool to remind yourself that we've got, you know, all these little issues. So I'm, I'm here representing more vital community shop, uh, trying to get my head around, you know, there's a few steps that we've that we've taken, but we but being a sort of retailer, we're buying in from so many other people, so many other sources, and the managers obviously are looking looking at all those issues. But and in producing an infographic graphic like that, I think would be a really helpful tool for us. Well, I, I can tell you that uh, as as a retailer, you have more influence on my business than this man when he was working with SIPA ever had. Yeah. The, reason that we were do the reason that we started a lot of this, and I say I'm a cynical capitalist businessman, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not running a commune, uh, but when companies like Tesco, Amazon, and, and so on start coming to me and saying, what are you doing about low carbon? I need to have an answer. Um, and it's the same in, in most other sectors, food hygiene and so on. The retailers drive this, and the retailers drive it because customers are asking the retailers the questions. That, you know, the people ask, you know, what's my power to do something about it? You know, activists can be a pain in the neck, but they can also actually influence more change than they probably give themselves credit for um, within these, the big corporates because of their purchasing power. So it, it's absolutely, um, you know, more battle community shop has you know, it, its pound of, of influence in terms of do you stock bleach or do you stock bleach tablets that you know have five percent of the waste cost less to transport and by virtue of what you stock in your shop you help to influence your community the fact that you're not stocking certain products so you know for me uh, you know a great starting point for me would be look at what you've got on your shelves and say actually this is an alternative to this can you, and can you help move that community to thinking differently about stuff just a few thoughts yeah, thank you. Um, so, you mentioned before about um, flying in bottles. Uh, obviously, COVID has probably created an unprecedented demand for your product. Do you think that's having an influence on some of the ways that you've looked at this? Because you probably thought to have bought in a, a what did you call it, a, a, a heat pump to yeah. break down plastic? Yes, um, so absolutely, COVID for us as a disinfection company, well, without going into too much detail on, on the complexity of our business, we have two parts to our business. We have a, a part which puts stuff in bottles, and historically that was mainly insect repellents. Um, suddenly people didn't travel anymore and didn't want any insect repellent, so that, that was a bad thing. And we had another part of our business which made water disinfection equipment, and you know, come March 2020, all those large projects stopped. Um, fortunately for us, we had a, a, a very small line in our business, which was making hand gels and disinfection tablets. It was probably less than 5% of our business in March 2020. Um, I got a number of phone calls on somewhere around about the, the 17th of March from people in government saying, essentially, your factory has been requisitioned. We would like you to start making disinfecting tablets very, very quickly. So we've pivoted, pirouetted, been like a ba ballerina in many uh, circumstances in looking at how we change our business and also how do we create a sustainable business going forward because the big thing I wasn't going to do in 2020 was to say yes we'll do this for a few weeks and then go back to normal um, 
So we are now engaged in five, six, seven year supply agreements with organisations like the NHS. So that gave us the opportunity to say, okay, if we're going to do this, that's fine, but we're going to do it properly and we're going to do it in a sustainable method and we're going to make those types of investments. Um, would we be doing it anyway if COVID hadn't happened? Yeah, I think we probably would do because at our heart, you know, we've always wanted to be at that leading edge. Um, I think it, COVID helped to, helped to refocus us and it gave us a, a scale that we could perhaps do things a little bit more quickly. Um, but I don't think we're doing anything that we weren't on the journey for uh, beforehand. Yep. Which I can't quite read. Yep. So um, we have uh, we have two. Um, well, in fact, we've got three types of EVs. We've got um, company cars, um, and at the beginning of the year, the leases were coming up on the hybrids and uh, our hybrid and petrol cars, and we took the decision actually we were going to change them uh, to full EVs. Um, that actually saved us money. I, I, we were doing the, the the stats on it a little bit earlier, so. The least costs for an EV versus a, a, a petrol car cost maybe 70 to 100 pounds more per month um, for us, but we're saving about 250 to 300 pounds in fuel costs. So it's, that's an absolute no brainer for us now. Um, and most comp the incentives that are there around people who have company cars uh, means that if you have a company car, you're absolutely mad in my view if you're not driving an EV. Um, we also have um, um, the Love Electric scheme which is something that we put out to all our staff whether they were entitled to a company car or not it allows them to lease an EV um, as the same as they would do on a bike to work scheme so they save about 30% um, and as a trade off uh, we felt for some of the support that we've been given in putting it up the solar panels and so on uh, we agreed that um, any staff who had an EV or a hybrid uh, could access power at work. So that encouraged them. Essentially, our staff can drive for free, they can drive for the weekend for free. Um, we're essentially using surplus power that we would otherwise be feeding back into the grid and only getting paid four or five pence per kilowatt hour, uh, whereas it would cost you around about 12, 13 pence per kilowatt hour to plug in at home. So the cost to us is actually relatively low. Um, it's a great staff perk. Um, particularly in the current circumstances, it helps us retain staff and the staff who are use, it, use it are obviously very happy to be able to... How many charging points do you So we currently have four at the moment. Um, so my car this morning was totally empty because I, I would use it all weekend. Um, I get about 200 miles on it. I plugged my car in this morning and by the time it came down here it was full. Um, so essentially we've got more than enough charging capacity with four. Seven, we've got two 7 kilowatt chargers and two 22 kilowatt fast chargers and we expect to probably put in another couple of 7 kilowatt chargers in this year um, but it's a relatively low cost to my business but it's a it's one of those low cost high value things for our staff that actually people like being able to a they like to be able to drive a cheap EV and b they like the fact that we're able to provide them free charging for it. Presumably you've had three phase supply uh, yes, we do, but the, we only, the only reason we have a three-phase supply is for the 22 kilowatts. You can quite happily run the, the seven kilowatts off a, off a single-phase supply. Do many of your employees take up the uh, bike-to-work scheme? Uh, we have, I think, four or five current bike-to-work scheme uh, people who have bought into that. And, those guys tend tend to be using them for leisure bikes more than anything else. If I'm honest, um, they're very the leisure bike was probably as expensive as one of the cars so that one of them that went through it. Um, unfortunately, you know we live we work at Pinnacle Hill. It, it's not great. Um, so yeah, the the bike to work scheme I, I think hasn't really kicked in. Um, I don't think it has a, a, a massive effect on car, uh, on the carbon footprint of people coming to work. The EV scheme, which works on the same basis, definitely will, and we have a, a number of people taking those up if they can get the EVs delivered in the next few months. Would the electric bike be better? 
Yep, um, so as a 40-something, I, I, I invested in an electric bike and I, I love it. Um, so yeah, you can actually get uh, electric bikes on the um, Bike to Work scheme now. Um, I say I'm not brave enough to cycle in from Melrose um, on my electric bike just yet, but it, it is, as a leisure bike, it's, it's great. I'm very conscious about time. I'd like to move on if that's okay. There'll be a chance to maybe ask a few more questions at the end. Please do. Yeah, I'll be hanging around, so please. Thank you so much again for that. No problem. So we're now going to move on and hear from Kasia. Kasia works for um, the... She's employed by the Selkirk Regeneration Company, and her job is to give advice to um, individuals in Selkirk on how they can reduce their carbon footprints. So we're delighted that Kasia come along tonight and just explain something about the work she does and, and where you can go for, for advice because I think as we're getting the message tonight there is a huge amount of advice out there it's a bit of a struggle sometimes fighting your way through it but Kasia knows all about that so <laughs> so reducing carbon footprint and saving money that's my spiel uh, very quickly we'll look at introduction assessment planning implementation and further action so let's start with an introduction. So it's about current, current situation in Scotland, uh, in the borders, which is in Scotland. Uh, so um, th that's actually a little bit outdated because it's from uh, 2019. And already 2019, the reduction we managed in Scotland was 45% from the baseline. Baseline was uh, 1990. Or 1995. Uh, these times are different because they talk about different uh, emissions. So like CO2 emission will be the first, 1990. So we already reduced 44 <clears> percent. <throat> uh, but what is the current situation? So one way to look at our housing stock, properties, um, shops, whatever, is to look at EPC, Energy Performance Certificates. So every, I would encourage strongly everyone to get an EPC, either for your home or for uh, non-domestic for your property. They are a little bit different, and uh, we'll get back to that. So uh, at the moment, talking about homes in Scotland, 82% uh, are C or D, which is the middle bracket. Uh, Non-domestic, uh, and that's a bad news. F and G, so it's bottom, and 56% of all our properties, non-domestic properties, are really, really energy inefficient. Uh, so, we already mentioned interim target 75% by 2030, uh, then 90% by, who can guess, what year do we need to reach 90% reduction? 2040. No. 2040. 2040, yeah. 2045 is zero, net zero. So. That's our trajectory. That's where we are going. Um, so when, when we talk about low and zero emissions heating systems, because that's one of the major emission production from our houses, homes, and from properties. So low and zero, zero would be heat pumps, heat networks, depending on <laughs> what do we use to heat the network, and electric system, uh, systems which predominantly are storage heaters. So if you are on one of those, you are already zero, zero emissions. Uh, low emissions, possibly hydrogen, but it has to be green to be low. Uh, and, and just uh, information from, from September, from this year, a Scottish government and uh, a Scottish Green Party uh, signed a shared policy, uh, which actually will impact all of us. So from September this year, there is no subsidy for um, gas or L LPG boilers. 
So previously, Home Energy Scotland that supports homeowners would actually help people to um, purchase boilers. So that's gone. Uh, and there is a strong push from gas and LPG boilers towards something more uh, eco. Assessment. So when we look at our current situation, either in your home, and I'm home energy advisor, so that's my primary uh, uh, target, but also when you, when you go to your work, to your shop, to your factory, to wherever you work, uh, you can make a simple assessment of your energy usage. So first of all, let's look at what we already have. So if you go home and you look through your papers, you may find EPC, which is Energy Performance Certificate. If you can't find it in your papers, you can look online. There is a register. You can type in your uh, postcode and then you will get your EPC if you have one. So when you look at your EPC, you will get something, if it's your house, something like this. If it's your property, it will be something like this. And actually, I'm quite amazed one, why people don't use those documents. They are not bulletproofed, but they, they present a lot of information. They will tell you uh, what is your energy, your house's energy uh, demand. They will split it between your heating and <coughs> other ele electricity usage. So just, just get hold of those and look through all the pages and see how your house or your uh, property is, is actually functioning energy-wise. Yeah. We already talked about it, energy bills. Uh, it's quite amazing when I talk to clients how very rarely they read their energy bills. Just uh, And then the third part is to do an energy audit. So we can have like two different um, phases. One is to look at your building, which is looking at your energy efficiency. And the other one is look at the beha behavior. If you're at home, so look at yourself, your kids, um, your guests. Um, if you work in a shop, look at your clients, look how they behave in terms of energy usage. Uh, so again, very quickly, there are a little bit different. <laughs> you can have a look at them. So that's from your home, that's from your business. And Actually, the numbers are just opposite. So we, you have to be careful when you look at them not to make a mistake. So just look at them, see what is happening. Um, short information. Um, if you are um, buying a property, selling a property, or constructing a property, you have to have an EPC. If you, EPC is is valid for 10 years, but actually I think the time scale will be even shorter. So if you have an old EPC, I would encourage you to go and get a new one. EPCs are, EPCs are done by assessors, they are certified, so you, you can rely to a certain degree on them. And it's the same with the um, businesses. If your business is above certain threshold in terms of space, you have to have EPC on your wall somewhere. Um, so what do we do when we do an audit? Well, you can use a thermal camera if you have one. If you don't have one, find someone who's got one. It's really excellent tool. It's not invasive and it can show you where are weak spots in your walls. Or if you want to check for drafts, again, this is a very simple tool. It's very cheap. You can buy it for your business. You can buy it for your home. And um, you just point it, and it will show you 
based on the color of the light, if there is a leakage there, if you are losing energy. Um, the next step would be just walk around your home, walk around your business and check for drafts, check for um, missing parts, uh, just walk around and take a piece of paper and, and just make note what is happening in your home, in your business. Um, look at your heating system, look at efficiency, how efficient it is. Is your boiler really, really old? If it's old and if it is gas boiler, then you really need to think about it. What will you do? Is it worthwhile to buy a new one or maybe look at different heating system? Um, you look at your equipment, you look at your computers, laptops, uh, whatever you've got in your business or in your house, see how, they, how energy efficient they are. Uh, and that's really important for me. Uh, water usage. We are not aware how uh, the, uh, the Scottish water is the biggest energy consumer in, the, uh, in Scotland. So if we can reduce how much water we use, we are actually helping without uh, paying for that. It's just, uh, it makes sense, just conserve, just, just save, not, don't waste it. Um, so the next step would be to look at people, how they behave. So do they close windows, doors? Um, you can do it at home, you can look at your business. How, how do people behave? Uh, how people use the equipment? Do they leave it on standby for night? And yeah, what do they do with it? Lights on, off. It's amazing how much energy we lose just by uh, not switching lights off at home and in our businesses. And you can also make a, or get a little questionnaire to check how what people do, not how, uh, what motivates them. It's really difficult to get a questionnaire and really ask people what motivates them because people tend to tell you what they think you want to hear. But if you ask specific questions, like how often do you do this or that, then you will get some reliable answers. And other stuff, uh, whatever is happening in your business, just, just look at how people behave, what is happening. Uh, where to look for help? Again, yeah, lots of uh, places, uh, but I've got three. So spe specifically talking about audit assessment. So um, Zero Waste Scotland, they have really great document uh, with the embedded tools. You can download it. There are templates. You can just follow uh, the process. So it's how to conduct an energy <coughs> audit advice and support and it's online you, you just you can use it for free it's available the next one is utility bidder and i i chose this one because it's very simple so you can look at it there are tools there you can download templates just follow follow the process and the last one it's from from the the government the u.s government and again, I decided to put it there because it's very simple. Um, it does not require a lot of uh, knowledge. It just requires prudency and, and just following the steps. So planning, obviously we identified a lot of things. So uh, we have the list, we follow the template, we filled in what is happening in our building, in our house. So. Uh, we just complete all the information, put it in one place, uh, then we quantify, and then we calculate, and th this is really important to put numbers. So because if we, if we uh, finish all the, our audit with an idea, oh, we need to make changes, but if we don't quantify and don't calculate, uh, then actually we want we won't do it. And the last part is to look at the payback. 
Again, it's quite important because it will motivate us to actually do it. Uh, so then the, the next part is, yeah, we need to do it. So, um, for example, heating. The simple solution, if you don't have uh, thermostats or if you don't have timers in your home, in your business, get them. Think about zoning. Think about, okay, where, where I'm losing heat? Where can I uh, actually keep, keep it longer? Uh, draft proofing, it's no brainer. Just, just, just do it. As, as it says, 30% of heating can be lost through holes in walls. Just fix it. Uh, pipe works. Sometimes we don't think about it, but all the lovely copper pipes, they are losing heat like crazy. So if you have water, um, uh, hot water coming through your um, copper pipes, plastics are okay, but copper pipes, just, just insulate them, lock them. You will save money. And obviously lighting, if, if you are still using old fashioned bulbs, go for LED. Um, so again, that's another resource. Um, you can get a lot of detailed information from um, small and medium enterprise guide to energy efficiency. Just go there and far direction. We shouldn't stop there. We can move. Um, and for example, think about repeating the process. Maybe next year we can do it again. Uh, get support, obviously. Um, be specific. And where can you finance your project? And that would be at the end, five, last five minutes, I, I will talk a little bit about financing. Thank you. Straight to Brian, who's going to talk about um, Renew Green Energy, which is a local company that's installing stuff in the borders as we speak. So, Brian, thank you. Thank you. Hi there. For those of you who don't know us as a company, we are Renew Green Energy and we're based in Gala Shields. Um, we've been supplying local businesses um, in the area with renewable energy products for about 11 years now. Uh, bang on the drum, so I'm quite excited to be here, be part of this whole kind of carbon revolution and helping businesses achieve um, their net zero and also, at the end of the day, save some money. So how, how do we how do we do that? How do we go about it? I'll keep this quite short because we're uh, we're we're starting to run out of bit of times. So. Points for discussion: energy solutions. How do we how do we how do we recover some of our carbon? How do we save some money? How do we go about it? The main two factors, obviously, every business runs on, we use electricity, so we've all got a bill, we've all got, you know, costs to bear, um, some more than others, and I hope the business doesn't mind if they're here, but we came up with quite an extreme example in the borders, um, so we'll get to that a bit later on. Um, heating, gas costs are set to rise, gas is, is going to be phased out, what, do, how, what can we do about that? Is there going to be a ban on fossil fuels? We just don't know. Of course, COP26, there is initiatives out there. How do we go about it? Hopefully, we can come up with some answers. Um, the first and the most simple, I guess, is solar PV. Um, we all have a bill, as we say, for electric. We're trying to do the right thing by the environment, save some uh, on carbon emissions, how do we go about that? Probably the easiest way um, is to look at solar. It's probably my go-to, especially you know if you have a large um, factory such as Scott Mass or you know any sort of roof space. It's probably the first and simplest solution to look at. Um, you might say, well, oh, it's difficult to get things on the roof. How do we go about it? Um, there's companies like ourselves out there. Go and speak to them. Um, they're quite well willing to help. Really, all we need to do is a quick Google Earth on the roof, um, look at your bill, look at what we can get onto the roof, see how much money we can save you and effectively how much carbon we can offset. Um, it is really straightforward, really straightforward. 
You can also look at other solutions like we touched on with electric vehicles. We can oversize the solar so that we can charge cars during the day for a fleet. If we have a fleet, whether it be one car you know, or, or tens of cars. Um, we can also look towards future proofing and all this comes through the apps that we get with solar. We can look at future proofing our energy costs and then actually being able to sell power to the grid. So we can look at battery storage, we can oversize our solar arrays, we can then do a bit of storage uh, which we can use so you could effectively, if you're a 5G operation, um, your solar is of not of much use at the weekends, so you can store that in your battery and start the, start the week afresh and have some power in the bank already, which again is saving on emissions and saving on costs, which is, as business owners we all know, is, is important. Um, the second and third are the more difficult solutions, but not impossible. We do a lot of work with uh, air source and ground source heat pumps. We're actually um, putting a ground source heat pump into Bowell House. Um, so if anybody says it's impossible to do a ground source in their property, then you know, we're going to look at that one as a, as a, as a no, it can be done. It definitely can be done. Um, but if we move back to the second one. Um, air source is your cheaper alternative, if you like. Um, it's easier to install than a ground source system. Um, in terms of savings, you're going to save around 40% on fossil fuels. Um, if your business runs on electric, then you know the savings are, are around 60 to 70% um, depending on your costs. There is, it's, it's not impossible. We can look at the buildings, we can look at what we can do. Maybe air source isn't, isn't, isn't possible, but talk to us, talk to other companies. There is, there is help out there. Uh, and the final one, ground source heat pumps. Um, if you have a car park, we can do boreholes, so you can drill up to 200 meters. Um, we can recover the energy from the ground uh, to then save on your emissions and save you, save you money. Um, here's, a, here's a pretty extreme example. So this is MTEL in, in, in Jebra. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, I hope they don't mind, but uh, we looked at this as a very, very extreme example. So we've, we've, we looked at installing solar on the roof here, um, getting, getting all the available roof space and looking at the carbon savings, that's 495 tonnes a year, not just over the lifetime of the, of the system. 14,000 trees uh, per annum. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty bold statement as a business to be able to say that every year we are, we are saving 14,000 trees and our carbon savings are 495 tonnes per annum. And of course, energy savings, estimated. we've estimated the cost per unit, but that solar system, based on current rates, will save that business that amount per year. Um, so it is relatively simple. Uh, you might say, well, why should I do it? Why should I bother? Um, because as we touched on before, you know, your larger companies, say you sell um, potatoes to Tesco's, they're going to come along one day and say, um, where's your carbon audit? I haven't got one. Well, sorry, we're not interested. We're, we're going somewhere else. So that's, that's, that's what's coming. It's definitely, it's definitely there. The government are looking to businesses, you know, potentially uh, taxed on carbon. We just, we just don't know. But there is opportunities um, to, to do systems like this. It is relatively straightforward. You could actually argue that this is more. This is this is a simpler operation than doing two or three houses. It really is that simple. Um, again, around funding, there is avenues there. There is opportunities. Um, speak to uh, Zero Waste Scotland. Speak to SOSI. Speak to your bank. You know, banks are looking with uh, at low interest loans um, because again, they want to be seen to or want to be part of the green revolution. Um, it's definitely out there. There's, there's lots of um, misconceptions about it's too difficult. I can't do it. You know, talk to people. There is, there is, there is ways and means. There is ways and means to do it. Um, as as Alistair has, has, has started on that journey. Um, again, when you look at electric vehicles, you know your running costs are 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 are, are, are much much lower um, than petrol or diesel vehicles. So it's definitely something to look at. And do we have any options? 
as we touched on before, we don't have two and a half planets, so we don't really have any more options. Um, so again, as we've been saying, there is, there is there is possibilities out there. It isn't that difficult. Um, come and talk to us. Come and talk to other companies. We can see what we can do, uh, you know, to help um, on a very small scale or, or, or large scale. So thank you. Thanks, it's uh, very very brief. But Any immediate questions for Brian? Or should we yeah, just ask one question. When yep. you're looking at those larger scale sol solar yep. array, um, how are you finding it to deal with SPN with actually connecting back into the grid for larger capacity sites? They, they've become very difficult, or they were very difficult, but they've now become understanding because they realise that they need places like this to be supporting the grid in the future. So what's going to happen is it's going to flip on its head. You're going to have all these small sites, whether it be your, you know, your house or your or your business, Scottish Power are going to want your power. They're going to want your electricity. Now that's the interesting thing, because their connection charges uh, and the way that they approach that are so high that they actually push some schemes out of the way. So I've got an example that we've been looking at, which would be a 42 megawatt site yeah. right on the edge, just outside Telso, that basically yeah. could supply most of Telso for most of the year. And they're just batting it away. They're not wanting to know about it because they know that we then effectively would become an electricity supplier rather than them, and they still have to support the network. Therefore, yeah. they're not supporting it. Yeah. And that's where the system has a has a real problem. It does. You're, you're absolutely right. It's uh, it is a real difficulty, and and one one of the things that is a is a stumbling block when you when you look at larger systems for sure is the capacity of the grid. And there's not that understanding there from Scottish Power, from SSE, that they actually require that power. They see it as an issue, yeah. not not as a, as a solution. Um, and it is yeah, it is definitely something that. That's where government really needs to come yeah. and step in yeah. and start basically pushing things yeah. around because yeah. there are loads of opportunities for microgrids um, yeah. in local areas, but they're being blocked at the moment by the network. Yeah. I think if, if, if Martin was still here, I think he'd be saying there's a big push within SOSI to try and address these issues yeah, locally yeah. because it right. is a problem. We know the, commu yeah. the community up the valley from Selka, for example, wanted to put up a wind farm. Mm -hmm. was told there was no capacity on the grid, so that was not viable as a community project. It would be viable if there was a local network, but establishing a local network is really difficult. Yeah. But it, I think it will become easier. Yeah. The ground is shifting. The, 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 the utility companies, and uh, Scottish Power in particular, are looking at it as a as a load on the grid, they don't see it as a as an easing of power on the grid. They look at the load because they're worried that you will transmit all that power further down the line, and it becomes a bigger problem for them at their power stations. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. On a smaller scale, not on that scale, is the um, cost of ground source, air source, solar PV, etc. Is that going to come down at all? Because previous experiences seem to suggest a lot of the cost was inflated due to the RHI you would get back. Um, yeah, I would say you're, I would say you're probably right there. When we started doing solar, um, you know, you were looking at a smaller yeah. array, uh, and the cost of that is now halved um, because of when the tariffs were removed, the cost of the of the kit, you know, uh, came down substantially. With their source and ground source, uh, again, it's. It, there's such a huge demand at the moment that I don't think the, the, the costs are going to fall that substantially, just but just purely because of the demand. How are you finding the planning for solar, uh, considering most of the council businesses are uh, landlocked and where uh, you have listed buildings? Um, it's not impossible. I would suggest it would be very long chance that's getting solar in the town. It's not impossible. Have you, have you spoke to the planners? Uh, no, but I've, I've dealt with planners for 25 yeah. years here yeah. and I gave them the window. And the same thing, you can't have anything else that you have or that you can't have a deep source with the yeah. ground. You can't yeah. have uh, anything on the buildings that would go against it. So yeah. really, none of these options are available to any of the Yeah. I'd, I'd maybe dispute that. So we had a, a thing put up in, on my parents' house, which is in, right in the conservation area, and it went through. No bother at I think all. you find the towns, the town centres different. But 
know, it's not in the conservation area. Even getting second degrees and a double breathing is, is not on the roof. It's not on the roof space. I can't see no. that. Yeah. No. Sorry? It's not on the roof, sp on the roof space, I think. You, no, yeah, no, but you're driving in town and you're going to see nothing but solar panels. I'm just going yeah. out because I'll tell you what it I think ground is shifting. I think you're right. I mean, yeah. there's, there's some of the planners of the old mindset where you know you can't do some of these things, but the councils are now, they're under the same they pressure that everybody yeah. else is to reduce I mean, carbon footprint. You look at, you look at the project we're doing at Bowhill House, you know, all right, they've got lots of land, it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's a, it's a, it's a heritage site, as, as I'd like to believe. So the council have, have welcomed that there um, because they know, they're, they're starting to understand, you're right, you're absolutely right in what you're saying, but the council is starting to understand that, that they've got to be part of this revolution as well and they've got to allow projects to go ahead. It still is difficult and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it will, it will become easier. Brian, thank you so okay, much. Thank you. Can I just give a very brief plug to Brian before he's well while he's sitting down? Yeah. We had we had an air source <laughs> project by Renew Green Energy um, early this year or late last year, and we had a bit of a hiccup because initially we thought we were going to have to rip out all our central heating pipes because there were there were micro bore pipes, and the worry was that if you didn't have a bigger pipe, you'd have to have new radiators, new pipes. Uh, and, uh, and the system wouldn't work, but we found there is now an air source heat pump that will use micro bore pipes, so we've got the same radiators, haven't had to do any changes to plumbing system at all, and the system is fantastic. And touch wood, it's, it's worked really, really well. So there is misinformation out there, and, and, yeah. and we have to be really careful that we, we confront that misinformation when it's there, because there is a, otherwise there's a danger that people say you can't do it, it's, that it's bad, you know, somebody down the road's had a system that doesn't work, and, and that can spread really bad yeah. news, and we need to try and spread the positive news, anyway, that's my note. Cash, you're going to wrap things up very briefly on, on yeah. sources of health yeah. because I'm very conscious we're, we're slightly yeah. overrunning. So it's zero, zero waste Scotland. So if you are a business or a small or medium sized enterprise, uh, they, they really can help you with energy efficiency. And we had already an example of uh, what they can do for you. But if you are uh, working from home and you are a business, but just work from home, you can get support from Home Energy Scotland. So Zero Waste Scotland won't support you if you work from home, but Home Energy Scotland will. So there is help available. So I just quickly general information about what they do. I won't read it. Uh, just. So uh, th they identified barriers and I, I think they are right. So we don't have time, we don't have technical skills. That's why we need help. We need someone who will come and will look at what is happening and will come up with some suggestions. Uh, so what you would get if you contact them and um, there will be information how to contact them at the end. So you, you would get a dedicated advisor, someone who will look into your uh, specific need. So, uh, and then they will be knowledgeable, they will know what they are talking about, and they are impartial. So they will not try to sell you anything. If, they, if you come up with an idea that, oh, you want this, uh, because an installer suggested that, they will come and say, no, this won't work for you. So they are pretty good. Uh, so, yeah, they, what they, are ha what they are doing, 20 million cost savings, uh, we can we can move. So that you will get at the end uh, energy efficiency assessment, and you showed. Oh, here is an yeah. example. So you will get that. Um, uh, and th that's a very quick example. So they worked with Highland Farm Cottages, and they helped them uh, to to actually go for renewables. And the, it's a bigger example. So at some point they went for PVs as well, so savings were even greater. Um, so that's the number. I think slides will be passed on so you will get the number and you can contact them via email. They are very busy, so you have to be patient. And uh, thinking about your homes, uh, energy, uh, Home Energy Scotland, they are, uh, Excellent. They are actually in charge of all available funding for homes and loans. Uh, loans are zero, uh, is interest-free loans. So if you need uh, financial support, go to them because they are in charge of all the money. Uh, so that's what you can get from them. You, and they said, okay, hurry up because money is running out and there is a as you can see, there is a lot of cash back. 
So you can actually get something that is not that expensive because you will get cashback from that. Uh, so that's where you can get support from Home Energy Scotland. That's me. Thank you, Kasia, that was great. And I should have said at the beginning, the slides will be circulated to everybody who's here tonight and everybody who couldn't be here tonight as well, so that information is there. Um, any last questions or comments? We, you're very welcome to hang around and finish off the food and have a chat before you go. But if there's any questions for the speakers that anybody wants to raise now? We'll have enough. Well, can I just thank everybody who's, who's um, spoken tonight? It's been really, really interesting and hopefully really helpful and positive for people. And um, thank you all for coming along. As I said, the plan next is to do a second event in um, either late January or early February, specifically looking at the opportunities for trades and, and how that links to house improvements. So we'll be circulating information on that um, in sometime in December. So um, hopefully see some of you then. Anything else I need to say? Is that okay? Great. Well, thank you all. Safe journey. Home.